started with the Arts Council asking me to curate a show from their collection, which is about uh, seven and a half thousand works in these four catalogues here. And so I spent an awful long time peering at these postcard sized black and white images of works that I was unfamiliar with on the whole, um, trying to sort of get some sense of what kind of exhibition I would like to put together, you know, because my, what, here it's, it's my taste that's on the line rather than my work. My kind of creative process, if you like, is often fueled by mischief. And I think initially my response was, ooh, you know, I, I, uh, I, I think it's more interesting what I leave out than what I put into this show in some way. And so I was drawn uh, away from more recent work, the kind of puns and concepts and what I call the stage sets of, of recent art. And I was looking more at the earlier part of the collection, which dates from, sort of from, I mean, there are earlier works, but basically it dates from the Second World War through to the present day. Um, and so the, the works that I was most drawn to at first were kind of works like, um, say, Elizabeth Frink or um, the Jack Smith or uh, the early photographs of people like Thurston Hopkins. First, what I went through, I made a kind of long list and it had the air of a village hall art show a bit at first. And I was a bit shocked when, like, when we kind of laid them out. And I realised that I needed to get a kind of cohesive uh, idea together to, um, to, to give the show some identity. All the works pretty much that I had chosen fell into three categories. That was figurative painting, mainly from the 50s and 60s, bronze sculpture from a, the similar period, and black and white photo documentary photography. And um, I was very happy with these gr three groups of things. They're all got a kind of strong tradition. They're all recognisable, what people would call art. And yet a lot of the artists won't be very well known. There are some stars like Henry Moore and uh, Barbara Hepworth and um, L.S. Lowry. But on the whole, I think people won't be overly familiar with these works. And so I was looking at them and that's kind of where the title came from. The idea that in the day, in the 50s, on the whole, if you asked someone um, to name a contemporary artist, they would struggle. It was a kind of innocence and goodness about it that I like. And it's for me, I don't know if it's all mixed up with my nostalgia for uh, the period sort of, I was born in 1960, so I suppose, you know, some of the things, particularly the documentary photographs by Tony Ray Jones and Thurston Hopkins, they really remind me of my aunties and uncles going to the seaside and sitting in pubs and having a glass of Maccasin and, and the kind of um, close-knit working class communities. And maybe I'm being romantic about that, but I've also included, you know, things like David Heffer's uh, arrangement in Turquoise and Cream, I think it's called, which is a kind of, you know, it's right at the end of the period of this show. It's, it's, it's the early 80s and already you see a kind of different attitude to of sort of working class subject matter. I mean, that is something that very much is in this show is it's artists looking at proletarian subject matter. And I think that's a very interesting theme. Yeah, this is Arrangement in Turquoise and Cream by David Heffer. And I think the title, Arrangement in Turquoise and Cream, I find it very interesting in that it kind of, I think there's a mocking tone to it in that it kind of uh, is a very art, it's an art reference to sort of early abstraction which the painting itself refers to as well. And yet it's a practically a photorealist depiction of quite a grim block of 1950s flats. And I think it shows uh, perfectly the kind of what I would call the catastrophic idealism of the planners thinking, oh yes, we can put people in these boxes and how humans won't be fitted into little boxes. And then the painting demonstrates this beautifully visually by all the kind of variety of sort of grubby curtains across the painting. So it's like a kind of a, uh, an abstract ideal uh, kind of um, subverted, if you like, by sort of common humanity. So I think that's a really interesting painting. So this show in a way is kind of a look at not just the art world of a slightly just before previous era, but also what Britain was like. I mean, and a, str a strong part of the, of the show is 
how this contemporary art stands for the Britain that it came out of. I mean, all the work is from British or British-based artists. In a way, I've kind of edited it to fit how I see the period of, say, 1940 to 1980. I, I call it a show trapped between two bombardments, the bombardment of the Nazis and the bombardment of the media and advertising. And the art is part of that system. Art has a status and um, part of the status of art in many ways can be that it's rarefied and seen as something that only posh people go to see. And now the Tate Modern you know, is, is, is thronged with people from all backgrounds. I think that's great in a way. This is a piece that I've made kind of in response to the works in the show and the idea of the show. And it's called Head of a Fallen Giant. And I suppose the overall idea of it was that it is a picture of Britain, what's happened to Britain really, in that it, it's a skull encrusted with imagery of a kind of cliche of Britishness. So it has the Union flag, it has the three lions, it has Buckingham Palace and post boxes and route master buses, it has Queen Elizabeth I, you know, the whole lexicon, if you like, of tourist Britain. And Britain is unusual in a way because, you know, there's a lot of debate at the moment about Britishness and what it means. So in a way, I presented a ethnographic object of Britain, a kind of ethnographic sort of voodoo sculpture of Britishness. And I think the skull is kind of, yes, it's true, I was reacting to Damien Hirst's skull at the time. That was, you know, when I was conceiving this piece, that was kind of in the, all over the papers and I thought it was an interesting thing. And I thought there are things in culture that are more valuable than diamonds. And so that was kind of the starting point for the idea. And I like the idea that it looks like it's sort of been dredged up out of the sea because we're a maritime nation, a warlike nation, you know, and, you know, well, who is at the centre of our most famous square? You know, Nelson, a, a sort of sea warrior. And so uh, I like the idea that it looks like, you know, some ancient sea god's head. But also Britain has to admit that it is not the great colonial world power that it was. And sometimes I want to say to it, oh, relax, you know, 